Season three of Formative is brought to you by the generous support by Macy's Inc., whose purpose is to create a brighter future with bold representation for underrepresented youth so we can realize the full potential of every one of us. Welcome to Formative, the show where today's leaders are interviewed by the leaders of tomorrow. Today's guest, Crystal Giles, became a full-time author after having a son and not seeing him and her family reflected in children's books. So she decided to write the books that were missing from the shelves. We're so glad to have her with us to share her story. Hello and welcome. I'm Rachel Gazdick, CEO of New York Edge. And my co-host today is Christina from MS425K. Christina, I'm so glad to be doing today's show with you. Can you tell me, hun, a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Christina. Uh, I have two older brothers. I'm in the sixth grade. I go to Frederick Douglass Academy 8. I like hanging out with my friends watching movies and reading the series Dork Diaries. I like to sing, dance, and draw. And when I get older, I want to be a singer, a dancer, and an artist. Well, I can tell, Christine, already that you are so incredibly talented and creative. And now you can add podcast co-host to that list as well. Yes, I have a lot of questions. Well, I don't want to hold you back. Okay, so let's not wait any longer and bring in today's guest, Crystal Giles. Crystal, welcome to today's show. Hello, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, Christina, I'm going to turn over the conversation to you. So why don't you ask your first question? The first question I have is, what was your favorite book to read growing up? I liked a lot of books growing up, so I was for sure a reader. The first book I remember loving is called Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters. It's a picture book, but back then, picture books, they were fully illustrated, but they had like longer story. So this story was about two girls and they were sisters and there was kind of a mean sister and a nice sister and they were trying to get the attention of a prince. And so um, I am the youngest of four and my sister right above me, I considered me to be the nice sister and her to be the mean sister. And so that story really rang true to me in my real life. And then as I got older, I also love lots of novels like The Babysitter's Club, which is out now in like graphic novel form, which is really cool. And in school, I read Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. That was a big one when I was in school, too. So lots and lots of books. Okay, that's a lot of books. When did you publish your first book? My first book was published in 2021. It was at the beginning of the pandemic, and I was very excited, but I was also very nervous. Putting your book out into the world can sometimes be a new thing, and you have no idea how people will receive it, if they'll like it, if they won't like it. My first novel, it's called Take Back the Block. And it took me four years to write and edit it and get it out into the world. And so once it's released, you have no control over it. What was the inspiration for the book, Take Back the Block? So the inspiration was community. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I lived here my whole life. And so just like everyone else, I think most people, they care about where they live. They care about their city. And... I was kind of sad and that my city was changing so much. I became very worried about what happens to children and families when their neighborhoods are kind of torn apart. In the book, there is a major community shift happening. And the formal term for that is called gentrification. But really, it just means that new people are coming into the city and they're changing the structure and they change where people live. And so oftentimes, new people come in and then they push their original residents out. And so that's what's happening in the story. And Wes, the main character, he's 10 and he's going to the sixth grade, right? Sound familiar? And he really just cares about video games and basketball and his friends, that's it. But as his neighborhood starts to change, he feels compelled to stand up for his community. And so he finds his voice in trying to save his home. 
the inspiration for that book came directly from my own community and a lot of the things changing around my city. How did you discover writing books was your passion? Well, I love this question because I can tell you that I was an adult before I knew writing was my passion. So in your introduction, you said that you loved lots of things. You named like four things that you wanted to do when you grow up and as you grow up. And I'm here to tell you that you can do all the things. I promise you. When I was young, I loved math. Math was my thing. And so I graduated school and I went to college for accounting. So I did finance and accounting. That was my thing. And I did that for many years. I did not discover a love for writing until my son was born. I started to read him books like most people do. And what I discovered was that I did not see enough books that represented him and our family. I wanted books about little black boys and little black girls and their families. And I couldn't find those exact books. I wanted to see pictures that look like him and the books we read. And so I decided that I would write a book, which was kind of random. And I was nervous and I was scared. I was terrified that I could not write well enough that people will want to read it. But I kept going anyway. And so today I am a full-time author and I write not every single day, but I write a lot. And so I was not brave enough maybe to be a writer until I was an adult, just about five or six years ago. This is a great answer. Have you ever wrote a book that you felt like was like, wasn't good enough to publish? Yes, many. OK, I have written lots of books <laughs> that no one will ever read. My first book, it was a picture book. I didn't draw the pictures, but I wrote the story and it wasn't very good. I thought it was good, but then other people read it and it wasn't very good. And so what I can tell you that what I learned in that process is that practice really does help perfect your craft and you will mess up a bunch of times. Right. Mistakes are part of the learning process. So I spent a lot of time practicing and writing not so good stories until I found a story that I thought was good enough to try to publish. So to answer your question, I have written many bad stories, but they helped me get better for my next one. OK, that actually answered my ne the next question I had. It was how did you find the motivation to keep writing books and like to pass and like make them publish? That's so, I kind of answered it, but I'll give you a, an even deeper answer. My motivation is always my son first, but second is young people, people just like you. I want young people to see themselves in books. I want young people to open up the pages and I want the kids in the pages to look like you and sound like you. I try to have current language I try not to sound like a middle-aged kind of person. I try to make you laugh in my books. So I try to pull you inside of my story so that you care about what you're reading about. I love to read and I want to share that as much as I can. So my motivation, um, people just like you, is young people. I want to give you books that you can carry around, that you love, that you share with your friends and family. So that's my biggest motivator to make sure that I create books that are real and that young people will love. What is your favorite color? Ooh, my favorite color is purple. I'm absolutely a purple girl and I don't like pink nearly as much <laughs> as I do purple. Okay, I like purple too. It's good. It's my favorite <laughs> color. Where was your favorite place to travel to? Ooh. So right now, as an adult, I love going to the Caribbean. My favorite vacation has been Turks and Caicos, but I've not been on vacation in a few years because of the pandemic and all that stuff. So I am itching to get back to a tropical beach. OK, what are one of your biggest fears? Well, that's a great question. You know, I have a son and he's seven. I think one of my biggest fears is that he will be hurt somehow and I can't protect him. 
I think as a mother, I always think about protecting young people in my life and in particular my son. So I think my biggest fear now is just protecting my son from all of the many outside forces or things that can happen to him. Okay. So can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. Okay. So my first question for you is what kind of books do you like to read? When you think about reading, what do you think? When I hear reading, I think comic books and like books that have like action words and like okay. books that like you could use in your imagination and okay. like, you can interact with. Okay, I love that. Okay. So interactive. There are lots of graphic novels out now that have some words, some pictures, and lots of action. My son loves those too. So I know that picture you're talking about. So when you think about who in your life, whether it's teacher, parent, who do you normally get your motivation from? Is it your friends? What, who in your life brings you motivation and encouragement? In my life, the people that give me motivation is my family, my grandma, my two brothers, my mom, my aunts and uncle, my cousins, and all of my friends. Oh, I love like, that. And like when I'm sad, they like just like comfort me and like they give me hugs and they tell me it's going to be okay. Nothing's going to go wrong. And they say like it's okay to cry because they cry sometimes too. I love that you have a great support system. You named like six people. I think that's beautiful. So my last question, what's your favorite thing to do with your friends? So if you had a free day to do anything you wanted to do, and you had a bunch of money to do it, what would you do? I would go to an all-you-can-eat buffet. Okay, I like that. I like that. Cool. But you like to eat? Yes. Yes. When I was a kid, me and my friends, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had, you know, a few dollars. We would go to the store, and we would get all snacks. We would get, like, chips, candy, everything. And we would have, like, a snack party. That's what we call it, <laughs> a snack party. We didn't have any money for the buffet, though. <laughs> but... A snack party. That sounds similar. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about being a children's author? Oh, oh, I have lots. Meeting young people is, is by far the favorite. I also get to take interesting things that happen around me or that happened to me way back when, and I get to put them in my books. And I get to give a hopeful ending. So sometimes in life, there's a situation that happens and it's not all perfect, right? Almost nothing perfect. And so in our book, I get to actually put a hopeful story together and give inspiration at the end of it. So in this book, Take Back the Block, it's about a boy and he's trying to save his neighborhood. And so... In real life, I get to take this story, make it fiction, and I get to smash it into a story where he gets to learn something, he gets to have fun, and then at the end of it, it's hopeful. I try not to make it too unrealistic, but you know, in, in fiction, I can use my imagination a bit. So I get to give stories that are full of hope at the end of them. That's the best thing about writing for young people. Did you have any books that were inspired by your family? I will tell you the truth. Every single book I write has little bits and pieces of my family. So, <laughs> which I then I never ask for permission, right? I just write. And so hopefully they don't get mad at me. And Take Back the Block, I think there's little pieces of my son's personality in that book. There's little pieces of my mom's personality in the mother character. So like there's this thing in that book where the main character, Wes, does not get to use the dishwasher because his mom wants him to hand wash the dishes, which I think is cruel. But my mom did the same thing. And so I decided that the, I would put that in a book. So that little tiny inspiration came from my mom. Also in that book, I talk a lot about community and organizing. And I did a lot of that kind of thing with my mom. Even if I didn't want to, sometimes she just took me places and I had to show up and act like I wanted to be there. And so those components come from that as well. In my newest novel, Not an Easy Win, there are components of that book that are based on my life as well. The main character, his name's Lawrence, and he's gotten into some trouble in school and he ends up expelled and it's not his fault. And so 
even though that never happened to me, his family situation is one that reminds me of my family situation. He lived with his grandmother and his mom. He didn't love living with his grandmother because she had some strict rules. And then also in this story, his father is away because he's incarcerated. And that was also a part of my life growing up. So what I try to do in my work is put real situations and real children on the pages. So like I told you, if a young person picks up the book, I hope that they see themselves and it makes them much more comfortable when they get to the end of the book because they get to see themselves represented in a way that they may not usually see themselves. That's a good answer. So do you have like a paragraph to share for us? Like we could hear part of your books? Yes. So I will share a little bit from my new book, Not an Easy Win. This is part of the first chapter. Lawrence, who's 12, he has gotten in trouble at school. He has gotten into a fight and he doesn't feel like it's his fault, right? He feels like he's been picked on a lot. And he's kind of saddened that he doesn't have his voice being paid attention to. But to be honest, he's also happy because he doesn't like the school very much, which is the opposite of me. I actually love school. But like I said, I want to give voice to all different people. So his mom has just picked him up from school and she's not very happy with him. So I stared out the window into the gloomy air. The gray sky stared back. She was right. I was trapped. We rode in silence for exactly 22 minutes before we turned off the main road onto a bumpy Polk Lane. Granny Street wasn't a dirt road, but it wasn't smooth pavement either. After lots of driving on and no fixing, it was mostly broken up pieces of asphalt now. Ma pulled off the cracked road into Granny's gravel driveway and turned the car off. She let out a deep breath. Look, Lawrence. This ain't all on you. Life is hard, and we've had a double dose of heart lately. Mom's voice was softer now, her version of an apology. I knew I'd never get the real thing. Ma wasn't the apologizing type. Whenever I did something wrong, I had to apologize. I wasn't sure why adults don't have to. For a moment, I'd forgotten about my stinging left eye. It would double in size if I didn't get ice on it soon. I sat in the thick air of Mom's car waiting for her to ask about it or at least see if I was okay. Two long minutes passed. All right, let's just go in and get it over with, Ma sighed. If she says something, we'll just say it wasn't your fault. It wasn't my fault, I wanted to yell, but I knew it wouldn't matter. No one cared about what really had happened. No one cared that I had a huge target on me since the day I started at that school. Everyone just looked at me like I was the problem. So that's the beginning of Lawrence's story. I can tell you that he does win. Things get better from that first chapter. He learns to find his voice. He finds a community of some great friends at his local rec center. And he learns to play competitive chess. And through that, he works through a lot of his internal feelings. And he does win. I won't tell you how he wins, but he does win at the end of the story. Wow, that's so great. Um, one last question I have for you today is, what inspired you to become an author? So I think I felt like in life that I had a career path and I thought I was good at it. It was fine. And then as I got older, I realized that I wanted to be more than fine. I wanted to be happy. I wanted to try new things and I wanted to create stories that I felt like were real. And so I decided I would give it a shot. So when I heard you say all of those beautiful things that you want to do in your life, it made me happy because when I was your age, I didn't think that. I thought I could do one thing and that's it. So I love that you have all of these aspirations and all of these things that make you happy. When I was young, I loved to read. And so that made me happy, but I didn't have a whole lot else. So I'm super happy that you have a long list of things that you want to try throughout your life. And I hope you will do all of them. I hope you will try. And even if they don't work out, you'll at least have that you tried, which I think is a very special thing. Thank you. So yeah, that was all the questions I had for you today. You know, I just love sitting and watching these conversations. Christina, you were phenomenal today. So thank you for co-hosting. We'll see you on television or on the radio sometime soon. I'm pretty confident about that. 
Thank you for your deep and interesting questions. And Crystal, thank you so much for being here with us. On our show, we ask our guests the same question at the end. If you could give advice to your 13-year-old self, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give? Ooh, so I would definitely tell my younger self to try new things. I was kind of a straight path kind of kid. Um, it was right or wrong, and that's it. I try to do the right thing. So I would tell myself to to take a risk and try new things. What do you think about that, Christina? I agree, but for my older self, I would tell her to like be herself and like never give up on what she wants to do. Like she could accomplish her dreams. Like she could do anything she like puts her mind to. Like if she wants to like be a teacher, she could go to like a school that like teaches you how to like be a teacher. If she wants to be an artist, she could go to um a school that like teaches you art. If she wants to be a dancer, you could go to school that teaches you dance and et cetera. Christina, that's awesome. That. We've never flipped that question. We should have done that at the end of every show. <laughs> <laughs> so see, this is what I mean. You're amazing. Yeah. Well, I want to thank both of you for being with us. And Crystal, thank you for your time. This means a lot to us at New York Edge and particularly to the kids so that they can see themselves as the next author, the next podcaster, the next scientist. You're all those things today, right? From a science exam to you name it, right, Christina? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you. That's it. Thank That's you. Wrap. Thanks for listening to Formative, a production of New York Edge. I'm your host, Rachel Gazdick. My co-host today was Christina from MS452K in Brooklyn. She was assisted by Denise Moulton. Season three of Formative is brought to you by the generous support by Macy's Inc. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Race Car. This episode was produced by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Post-production by Alex Brower. Original music by Garrett Tiedemann. Production management by Gabriella Montekin. Thanks to the whole team here at New York Edge for making this series possible. Never miss an episode of Formative by subscribing to the series at newyorkedge.org slash formative or wherever you get your podcasts.